Thank you, Brother Frank and Debbie, and good to be with you all. Happy New Year to everyone. In the year 2022, we start another opportunity to live for our blessed God, to live as a testimony for Him until He comes. And we're going to come back to Acts 17 to this message the Apostle Paul gave because this is so central. It's, it's so important to understand and, and so uh, relevant to the world in which we live, particularly in the world of academia, in, in the world of university. Uh, we, we said, you know, some have titled it the Areopagitica. Okay? And a neat little word because it was at the hill of Mars Hill, the Areopagus, where this was given. I've been there to the site, it doesn't look anything like it did in the first century, but it's near the, the Parthenon is very close, and of course you see that on pictures of Athens. And uh, one of the things we learn in going door to door and, and witnessing for the Lord, as well as other forms of public ministry and the gospel, is and you know this is true, I'm reminding you, is to know your audience. Right? You're sharing the gospel, whether it be one-on-one -on -one or one-on-three or, one -on or in the groups, to know who you're speaking to, to know something about them, to know something about their culture, to know something about their background, and particularly <coughs> how much they understand with regard to the Word of God, the Scriptures. Right? And, and so this is why... It, this particular chapter is so important because I'm so thankful the Holy Spirit led Dr. Luke to record this in the book of Acts. Uh, it's, so, it's so important to understand the methodology. Now remember, you say, well, it's Paul's methodology, and that's true, but it's also the Holy Spirit's methodology because Paul is a spokesperson for Jesus Christ, is an apostle. So he's speaking for the Lord Jesus, inspired and led and guided by the Holy Spirit, different sometimes than you and me. You know, we, we pray, we hope we're walking in the Spirit as we're sharing the gospel with someone, we're praying that the Holy Spirit guide us, but it's different than for the apostles, because they're recording Scripture. And Scripture is totally, 100% true from God. Now, I think it's interesting, too, I, I should note, I was taught this as a young Christian, I remember, uh, over in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you should turn there and see it for yourself, uh, after Paul, and we'll, Lord willing, get into Acts chapter 18, the chapter that follows this, where Paul goes on to Corinth, a little south of Athens, and he says in chapter 2, uh, in verse 2 of 1 Corinthians, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was taught, and maybe you heard it too, uh, some still teach it, that, um, well, see, Paul went to Athens and, and he never mentions Jesus Christ and Him crucified at Athens. That's one of the things that is interestingly absent from the area of Gennesaret. And there's a reason for that. And there's something we can learn about that. And so, and there weren't many people converted. And so he decided when he went to Corinth, oh, I, I messed up, I, I left out that, so I'm going to make sure I include it to the Corinthians. You maybe have heard that. But you've got to understand the audience. When Paul went to Corinth, as we shall see, he went to the synagogue. <laughs> okay? Just as he had in Acts chapter 14 and in chapter 13, that great message of Paul in Pisidian Antioch. Remember, we looked at that. And there he's addressing people that have a knowledge, and not only a knowledge, but a reverence for the Bible. They know the Old Testament. They know the book of Genesis. They know all these promises about Messiah coming. Paul knew that when you approach uh, people that gathered in a synagogue, whether they be the Jewish people, or there would be Gentiles there too, both God-fearers and proselytes, depending on whether they submitted to the ritual of circumcision. So, Paul understood the difference. 
And we have to understand that too. So Paul isn't saying in 1 Corinthians 2.2 2, that he messed up in Acts 17. Okay? Uh, God forbid that we would go down a road like that. Because Paul's message in Acts 17 is just as inspired as his message in Acts 13. So why? Does Paul take a different tactic? Why does God take a different tactic? Because the audience is different. And as we share the gospel and live the gospel, we need to understand that too. We are increasingly, in our day, I mean, here we are in 2022, and we're living in a time of greater Biblical illiteracy than 50 years ago after the war, the Great War. Amen? Would you agree with me on that? There was a greater understanding and reverence for, even if they didn't understand it, at least a reverence for the Holy Scriptures in the 40s and 50s and even down into the 60s a little. But that all has been jettisoned now. And we live in an era of technology. And intellect and invention, right? I mean, the inventions are coming out almost annually now. What number, what generation of iPhone are they on? Oh, really? They started in 07, but the first one, and we're up, yeah, 13, good, good. She's keeping up. And so, Paul has this understanding that the Greeks thought they were better. You, you, know, you have to take my word for it unless you want to search it out, but they thought they they were the elite nation. I mean, they can go back 500 years before Paul's message here, the golden age of Greece, you know, 500 B.C. And then you get into the, around 330 B.C., you got the era of Alexander the Great, when he took over the Medo-Persian Empire, just within about a decade. It was a, we talk about a blitzkrieg. When he conquered the whole and spread what was called Hellenism, which is the Greek culture, which includes the Greek false religion. I was brought up with it in the Catholic school. I had in seventh and eighth grade, I had to memorize the Greek pantheon. And I still, I wished I didn't remember, but I still remember some of the names of the gods and goddesses and and the whole story of them and all of that. And it's fascinating in the sense of literature. But in the sense of truth, it is false. It is, I'm, I'm just going to categorically say it, I hope I don't offend anybody, but it is totally false. And so I'm titling this message today, God's Message to False Man-Made Religion. You realize there is a religion that's false, and there is a religion that's true. And so you can set them up here. It's two, you've got false religion, which is everything man-made, and you've got Christianity, which is true according to the Word of God. And you come into the relationship with God and your understanding of Christianity all by the basis of faith. It is a faith relationship with the living God. False religion is all based on the five senses, right? What you can see and touch and hear and smell. Now there are various categories of false religions depending on what culture, what area of the world you go into, right? All kinds of ceremonials and rituals, and, but it's all man-made. It's not from the Word of God, and it's false. And that's what Paul is arriving at here. And we looked at some of the, what Luke gives us as the backdrop earlier. We're going to pick up in verse 22. But the backdrop Luke gives us with the Stoics and the Epicureans, which were the two main categories of philosophy that go way back to basically 500. I mean, this 500 years of philosophy, they were very proud of it. They believed that they were the only nation or one of the few nations that settled their area, the area of Achaia, the southern Greece, 
uh, right from the beginning, which they, they didn't settle it from the beginning, because the Bible tells us the nations were dispersed after the flood, right? And Paul will bring that up in the message. To me, it's fascinating. Paul draws his message to them, primarily from Genesis 1 through 11. You say, well, the creation is in Genesis 1 and 2. But Genesis 1 through 11 in the Bible is a unit of thought, really. It's all together. It's either all true or it isn't. And that includes the creation account. It includes the fall in chapter 3 of Genesis. It includes the flood in chapter 6, 7, 8, 9. And then it includes the table of nations in, in chapter 10, which is the dispersal of all the nations that came from Jacob, Shem, and Ham, the three sons of Noah. And they're right. All the nations after the flood came from Noah and his wife, basically, what we could say. And then you have the Tower of Babel in chapter 11. And then the end of chapter 11 sets up, these are the generations of Terah, the father of Abraham. And you move into the whole Abrahamic story, which covers chapter 12 through the rest of the book. So I, I conclude that the creation account is really Genesis 1 through 11. Because that's what sets up everything as we know it in our world today. And that's what the Holy Spirit leads Paul to bring the Greeks to here. So they come with all their philosophy. And, and they say, Paul's coming in with this new teaching. So what's the approach Paul should use? What's the approach you would use with someone who's never heard about the Bible, never been to a Bible study, doesn't know anything about Messianic prophecy and Messianic promises that go all the way back to Genesis 3.15, right? Doesn't know about the creation account even, very likely. Paul's assuming they don't know any of these things. You say, well, could we encounter anybody like that in our day? Yeah, just go over to UL. Just go to any university. That's how it's being taught now. Most of the professors in universities teach on the basis that, well, I was taught that in a, in a Jesuit high school, that this is just a book of literature. Just literature. That's all it is. You have this book, and you have the book of the Quran, and you have other books of Buddha, and, and, and different things, and they're all just the same. But are they? Or are the scriptures different? Now, you'll have to decide that for yourself. But your decision, let me just warn you, and Paul will warn the believers here, or the people that are hearing the message, your whole eternal destiny is at stake based on your relationship to this book right here. Whether you believe this is truth or not. Where you're going to spend eternity. And that's the approach Paul uses. So he talks about God that basically the outline forms around him as creator, as provider, or sustainer. So we use the biblical, the theological word is providence, right? God and providence. So God in creation, God in providence, and then God is judge. And then as he brings out the judgment, he'll bring in the resurrection, the truth of the resurrection. But there's nothing about the cross, there's nothing about the shedding of blood, because these people, they were shedding blood, but they were shedding into their false gods. So they knew about it, that methodology, but they were so twisted up in their thinking. So this is the approach that God leads them to do with him. Now, of course, those that were responding to the message, when they heard about the resurrection, well, what do you mean resurrection? They were struggling with that, right? Because there wasn't any resurrection in their philosophy. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, it wasn't in there. And so they struggled with that. But the ones who were searching, the ones whom the Holy Spirit was drawing, right, to God, would say, well, why was he resurrected? Well, because he died. Well, why did he die? Well, because, and then you, you end up taking him to the cross that way, see? But you would do that with people that were searching, that were seeking the true and living God. You know what happens 
that you rush right into it and you cast your pearls before swine, right, as the scripture says, they just trample on the word and then they'll trample on you. So you have to know your audience. And Paul did. So his, and then as, you see this is really six points that he, he goes through here. Follow along with me, see if you do. He starts with making a point of contact with them where they were. Okay? And the same is true when we want to address the gospel to someone that God has put on our heart. We need to meet them where they are. You start with where they are. You don't start with where you want or God wants them to be. You start with where they are. That's logical, isn't it? So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, verse 22, and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Now, religious in the sense, some of your versions may say very superstitious, and that Greek word has that element in it. So it's a general word for religion. It could be true, it could be false. In this case, he's going to show them that it's false. But he doesn't come right out and say that yet. He, he agrees. He said, because, I mean, the Greek pantheon, I forgot, how many, is there a thousand gods in it? How many in the Hindu pantheon? I mean, I think I've heard there are 1,100 gods in the Hindu pantheon. That is, all the different gods and goddesses that they see control our world. And it's all false. Right? Now, we who are believers in the Lord Jesus, we've been brought to see that by the Holy Spirit. We're not better than them in that sense, but we've responded by the help of God, by the grace of God, to the Word of God, to the message in the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit has to help us to understand that, you see. So he says, look, I'll admit that you're very religious. And as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, by the way, you probably have seen me, brothers and architects, so he would understand. And, and I was an engineer working with buildings and architects that design buildings. And I just, I'm fascinated with forms and shapes and, and, and the imaginations of men to, to design the, and then build some of these amazing structures. And the structures of ancient Greece, I mean, the architecture and the art was tremendously advanced. We have to admit that. Now this fed their ego and fed their pride, and that shouldn't have happened. Then it, couldn't have, it shouldn't have made them think they were better than the barbarians. <laughs> See, you know, they had, or the barbarians were over there in modern-day Turkey. The barbarians were up there north of the Danube River, right? The bar, 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 the barbarians. And so they thought, we're the educated and they're the barbarians. Just like a lot of intellectual elites in our day think that. So he says, I'm, I'm walking through. Now I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. <laughs> so right away, the Holy Spirit leads Paul to say, look, unknown, that's their problem, ignorance. It just means lack of knowledge. I mean, we use that word in a derogatory way today, and we should be careful about that. But agnosis just means no knowledge, lack of knowledge, ignorance, unknown. See, they, they had all these different gods and goddesses, but just in case they forgot one or missed one, they had one to the unknown god. Maybe there's one out there we don't know. And Paul says, that's exactly the one I want to talk about. The one you don't know is the one I want to inform you, proclaim to you. Isn't that genius? But the genius is, well, we could say partly false, but I think it's God's. Because God loves these people. Just like He loves the person that you're praying for and sharing the gospel with. He loves them. He's not willing that any should perish. Amen? This is our God. Our God loves it and wants to save them. It's the people that are resisting God's love. It's not God resisting. God's wide open. Has been for 2,000 years for sure since the cross. And of course he was before that too. So therefore the one whom you worship 
in ignorance, we could say. In my version, it says, without knowing Him, I proclaim to you. And He's going to proclaim Him as Creator, as Provider, and as Judge. All right? So as Creator, verse 24, God, Elohim, who made the world and most things that are in it. Is that what it said? That's what people tell us today. Maybe. They may, they may give him credit for that much. He authored the Big Bang. Maybe they'll, they'll say that much. But then the Big Bang took over after that. No. He made everything in it. By the way, hold your finger here if you will. I just want to show you one verse, okay? Outside of Acts. And that's over in Hebrews chapter 11. And you say, I thought you'd take us to Genesis chapter 1. Aha! Uh -huh. No, there is a statement in Hebrews chapter 11 that is so clear. But there are many places we could go to. And in Hebrews chapter 11, which we see, we usually teach as accurately, as the faith chapter, the hall of faith. People who live by faith, going all the way back to Abel the son of Adam and Eve. So starting with Adam and Eve, all the way forward to the writer's day in the Hebrews. And in verse 3, he talks about creation. He's going, to, he's going to demonstrate that each of these people, by faith, responded to the revelation of God, the Word of God, and acted on it. Okay? They didn't just think about it intellectually and say, hmm, we'll discuss it. No, no. They thought about it intellectually, responded by faith, and then acted on their faith. Every one of them did. And in verse 3, he says, By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. That's what God says in Genesis. Let there be light. Right? So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. What? To the Big Bang and every evolutionary hypothesis says that they start with something material, right? And then it expands and grows, whatever. What's the Word of God saying here? Ex nihilo. God made it out of nothing. He didn't start with dirt. He didn't start with a solar system or a planet or an exploding star. It says it very clearly. The things which we see now are things that were made of things that were not visible before. Out of nothing. And you say, well, so-and-so says, But was so-and-so there? No. Were you there at creation? No. I didn't know. Was anyone there? No. So whatever we decide about creation, I'm going to start from faith in something. You want to put your faith in evolution? That's between you and your soul and where you're going to spend eternity. You want to put your faith in the Word of God? See, ultimately, what we believe comes back to the source of the truth, doesn't it? That's why I said there's false religion and there's the truth, the Word of God. And even though in your mind you struggle with understanding that, or in your heart your feelings say, I just can't accept that in my feelings. Faith says, I believe it because God says it. See the difference? And that's what it comes down to for everyone. Now he could have gone to Psalm 33, which says clearly the same thing. He could go to Psalm 19. To a certain sense, he could go to Psalm 50. But here the writer of Hebrew says, God, hey, he just states it. And that's what Paul, we come back to Acts 17. That's what Paul does here, right? God made all of it. The heavens, 
and the earth. The big things and the little things. I was hearing uh, from ICR the other day about molecular nanotechnology. Are you up on that? Molecular nanotechnology. Because of the electron microscopes, we can go down and look at things that you couldn't even see with a regular microscope, let alone the human eye. And you look at different bacteria and these different elements, and they have little engines in them. Little things with rotating parts and all these kind of things. <laughs> you see? And Jesus Christ made all of that. The little thing. And then you look up and then through a telescope and you see a galaxy with multiple planets and stars connected to it. And it's beyond anything we can imagine. And he made that too. From the biggest to the smallest, God made it all. You believe that? What's in the Word of God? And you can't say, well, I believe in the cross, but I don't believe in creation. Right? You can't approach the Word of God like that. You either believe in all of the Word of God, or you don't believe in any of it. <laughs> you can't, because God doesn't allow us to do that. He tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16 that how much Scripture is inspired? All of it. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all inspired of God. And profitable, too. <laughs> For instruction and correction and reproof and training in righteousness. Okay, so Paul says, God who made, verse 24, Acts 17, God who made the world and everything in it. Since He's Lord of heaven and earth, He's not part of the creation. If He made the creation, He's not part of it. He's outside of it, right? He's Lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made with hands. I love it. Now, the, the temple to Artemis, or Diana, in ancient Ephesus, has been reconstructed. It got damaged by earthquake, like all of the city of Ephesus. And I saw it some years ago, in, in modern day Kushada City, is where it is in Turkey. And, and it, it's a massive, it, it's, it is ornate. I mean, that, I forgot how many columns. And you think, of, it's genius, mental genius from a man that built all of that. But to think the God that made all of this that we see, from the largest to the smallest, dwells in that man-made structure? But how many people today put God in a box? It may not be a temple <laughs> built out of Corinthian columns, but something else, right? Confine God to something. And you can't do that with God because you can't confine it. So it, he's saying, think about it, it's ludicrous to think that the Lord of heaven and earth could be in that little temple you made with your own hands, he's saying to the Athenians. Now that had to be a blow to their pride because they, that's what their philosophy taught them, their false religion, just like false religions do today. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed something from us since he gives to all life, breath, and all things provided. See? You realize your next heartbeat, your next breath. We have a lot of appreciation for that more now it's because of COVID, right? Respiratory and breathing, we don't take even that for granted. But a lot of people do. Do you realize your next breath is in his hand? He's involved in his creation to that extent, you see. We just take for granted that you thank him for it, by the way. I forget to thank him all the time. I'm training, I'm asking by his help to train me to be more, to not, Lord, don't let me be an ingrate. Right? To, to not be thankful for all of the blessings that you've bestowed in, in all of my years. But especially the years since I've known the Lord Jesus as Savior. So he says, he doesn't need anything from you or me. He made us. He made the creation. And the idea, see, that in the Greek philosophy, no, no, we give something to the, to the gods, you know, that they need. And the gods manipulate this, manipulate that. God doesn't need anything from you or me. Jettison that thought. He didn't save you because he needed you. 
He saved you because He loves you. And we're not indispensable either, or not a one of us. Say, man, I don't know. This ministry couldn't go on without me, someone like that. Oh, yes, it can. And God can prove it to you if you want him to. He can remove you very easily. It'll go right on, maybe even better. That's up to him. We're totally dependent on him. That's what he's trying to communicate to him. And he has made, now he adds in verse 26, the beginning of the nations. He's talking about Genesis chapter 10 and 11 now. After the flood and the dispersal of the families, Mount Ararat, right, brethren, right, just to the north of Lebanon, the Mount Ararat, that's where the ark landed, and uh, I believe it's still there. Some have uh, seen pictures, it looks like it's there. But whether it's there or not, the Word of God says it's there, that's where they landed and dispersed. The Ghani then, the Garden of Eden, was probably right outside that area, in northern Iraq, that's what's believed over there still. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. What? So the Greeks couldn't take pride in the fact, no, no, our nation is different from the barbarians. We're, 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 or, or if you're in Adolf Hitler's days, the Aryan race is superior to all the other races. Right? No, no. He made from one blood all the nations that are on the face of the earth. God did. Man didn't do that. Evolution didn't do that. Chance didn't do that. Fate didn't do that. And the Greek pantheon of gods and goddesses didn't do any of that. See? From one man. Noah. After the flood. And his three sons. Or you could take it back to Adam if you wish. But he's talking about the nations. And they came in the dispersal after the flood. And why are there multiple nations? Why isn't it just one nation? From one blood, why don't we all speak the same language? Well, the Bible tells us. Because they, instead of dispersing, this is in Genesis 11, instead of dispersing like God asked them to, or commanded them to, they decided, Nimrod and his group decided, well, no, we're going to build a, we're going to build a city and a kingdom. And, and he ruled over people. He made people his slaves so they could build for him. And they built that ziggurat. You know, we're going to build a structure to heaven out of stone, bricks, and mortar. And God stopped it and dispersed the nations by doing what? Language. Languages. <laughs> and all the languages you say, that's so simplistic. That's what the Word of God says. You want to be in the category of man-made religion, false religion, you want to be with the truth. That's up to you. But Jesus Christ is the truth, right? The way, the truth, and the life. So if you, if you want to follow Jesus Christ, you've got to be in the, in the biblical category and not in the man-made category of false religion. It's up to you. And, and he goes on to say, not only that, he is determined, this is the middle of verse 26, their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. That means as the nation spread and then certain empires grew up and the different ones in different areas, first in Egypt and then in Assyria and then into Babylon and so forth. God was controlling that. Yes. Satan was too to a certain extent, but under God. And we read a lot about that in the book of Daniel. Don't we? And Satan's and his demons and the involvement they have in the governments of the earth still to this day. It hasn't changed. There's nothing new under the sun. It's still that way. Until the Lord comes back to rule, it will be that way, you see. Says the word of God. And so what's the purpose? Why did you do that, Lord? Verse 27. So that. That's a purpose clause, right? And you see uh, that or so that. That's the beginning of what we call a purpose clause. He's about to explain the reason. He's answering the purpose clause answers the question, why? Why did you do that, Lord? 
so that they should do what? Seek the Lord. Seek Him in the hope that they might grow for Him because they're so immersed in darkness and find Him though He's not far from every one of us. So whatever your theological system you take, make sure it includes human responsibility. Right? Man is not a robot. Man and woman are made in the image and likeness of God. And part of being the image and likeness of God is the freedom to choose. Don't take that away from people. If you take that away from people and say, oh no, 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 you're predestined to hell because God didn't love you and he never did love you or your nation and there was no way you could be saved. That's, there are theological systems out there that teach that. And they're false. <laughs> and I hate them because if one person goes to hell forever because of believing that and not responding to the gospel, I don't like that. I don't like that and God doesn't like people being deprived of the opportunity to choose. Because everyone is going to make a choice. That's why when it gets to the judgment section, it will be consequences of their decision. So, you say, well, what about the drawing ministry of God? Yeah, well, God's involved in that and helping to make the right choice with every individual too. Did you know that? And that's why we were sharing the gospel with someone. We are in prayer. Lord, be opening their eyes to see the truth. Because they're bound up in darkness, but they don't know it. Proverbs 4.19, right? They stumble in the darkness. They don't even know why. And they don't know they're in darkness. I didn't know it either before. I was saved. I thought it was okay with my man-made religion. With all its ceremonies and rituals. I thought I was okay. The religion told me so. But I wasn't okay. And it was the Holy Spirit that finally convicted me. This idea of seeking after God and making a choice is all through the Bible, right? What did the Lord Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Ask. Seek. Not. That's all pursuing God. Now God's seeking after us, but He's drawing people to seek after Him too. At the end of Deuteronomy chapter 30, therefore choose life. Right? He tells, well then it, is God just lying to people? He's saying, well, you, you can't make a choice, I'll have to make a choice for you, but I'm still commanding you to choose life. No, no. They could choose. It was up to them. We see this all the way through the Bible. Elijah, in 1 Kings 18, remember? He says to the people of the northern kingdom, how long will you falter between two opinions? That's a choice. How long will you go back and forth and sit on the fence? Is what he's saying. If Baal is God, worship him. If Jehovah is God, worship him. But get off the fence, is what he's telling them there at Mount Carmel. They've got a big statue there at Mount Carmel today to Elijah for that very incident. Elijah and the false prophets. 450 false prophets against one man. Don't tell me that man isn't great. People want to mock Elijah sometimes because he ran away from Jezebel. Well, he knew what Jezebel had already done to many of the prophets of God. He had tortured and murdered them. And God had permitted her to. And he didn't want to be another casualty of that. I, don't, I would have been running with him. Altering between two opinions. And the same is all the way through, the, even all the way in the book of Revelation chapter 22, that Paul is, make a choice. And in Romans 10, 13, Paul says, Whosoever, and he's quoting Joel too, Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be what? Say. Calls on the name of the Lord. Well, do I really have that option? Yes. By God. You have that option. You have that option today. If you haven't already. 
to call on the name of the Lord, to ask Him to save you. I knew, I've met a lot of people in my younger days as Christians that thought they were Christians, but they weren't. I said, have you ever asked the Lord? He said, well, no, I don't remember. I just, you know, I heard a message and I agreed with it. Well, that's just intellectual assent. That's not new, new birth. Right? You, you, you know, like Billy Graham said, you can be born in a garage. That doesn't make you a car. You know, you, you've got to understand the message and believe it and act on that faith, like Hebrews 11 says, right? You act on it. And so Paul he says, the whole reason for all of this is that you might seek the Lord. Now, there's a lot of truth that they don't know yet. That Paul isn't going into that here. And in your first or second or third or tenth encounter with an individual, like the guy sitting next to me on the plane, who was a pilot, retired pilot, you don't know how far you're going to get in this, right? But you're careful to work to start with where they are. That was a total pagan. Start with where they are and work through to the truth. That's what Paul's doing here. And so verse 28, for in Him, in God, look at this, we live and move and have our being. And then he connects to their, their, their poets, he says, and even some of your poets have mentioned that we're all the offspring of God. So he said, you should, have, you should have known this. And that's a way of saying, made in the image and likeness of God. Now he moves into the challenge to their acting, their will. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, that is, since we are made in the image and likeness of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art or man's devising, right? That's not logical. <laughs> that we're made in His image, but then we're going to make Him in our image? No, that, that's not logical, right? And He says, truly, these times of ignorance, the unknown God, God overlooked, but he, something has changed in God's timetable. What has changed in the first century AD? His son came to this earth. That's what's changed. But now, God commands how many men and women? All of them. Where? Only certain nation groups? Everywhere. He commands them to do what? To repent. <laughs> you see, repent means a change of direction. Whereas they were going this way in false religion, in false thinking, in error, they turn to the true and living God. That's what 1 Thessalonians 1.9 tells us, right? You turn to God from idols, to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven. That's what repentance means. It means a change of mind, metanoia, a change of thinking. And their thinking was all wrong. He's already addressed that. And so it, therefore, is it okay for God to command all men everywhere to repent? Yeah, He's already proven that God is the Lord of heaven and earth. <laughs> he is the sovereign authority in this. Not you and not your professor, or not your parents. God is the sovereign authority over your soul. And we're going to spend eternity. And God says, I command all men. So don't say repentance isn't in the Bible. Here it is, among other places. Because he's appointed, verse 31, a day. The Bible calls it the Yom Jehovah. The day of the Lord, right? He's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. That's his son, Jesus Christ. Well, how do we know that, Paul? Well, he's given assurance or proof of this to all by raising him from the dead. The resurrection. You see how integral the resurrection is to the gospel. And that's all the way through the Bible. 
but especially in the book of Acts. So you see, he finishes. He Has he mentioned the cross? He mentioned Calvary. Has he mentioned blood? No. He could have said, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Now, that's a Leviticus 17, and they don't have a connection to that. They don't know what Leviticus is. And the person you may be sharing the gospel with doesn't know that either. Don't assume they know anything of the Bible. Don't assume that. You have to ask questions to find out where they are and their knowledge of the Word of God. They may know some parts of it. They may not. And we do it respectfully. In gently, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, right? We recognize, we respect, and God respects, <clears throat> pardon me, God respects their ability to choose. He will not force himself on anyone. And nor should we force ourselves or force Jesus Christ on anyone. And we don't want to trick them. We don't want to deceive them. We don't want to play a game and, and, and they will say, oh, I got another notch in my belt. I tricked him and believe him because it may not be a true faith. We want to respect their intelligence. We want to respect their will and their ability to choose. But we need to warn them that their decision, they can't blame on daddy or mommy or coach Martinez or Professor so-and-so, right? They can't blame on, well, you don't know the circumstances of work, or you don't understand the abuse I was in. No, no, we, we, we're sensitive to that. A lot of people have been abused as children in our day. We, we want to be sensitive to that. But they can't use that as an excuse because Jesus Christ can set them free. <laughs> Amen? He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It's for liberty in Christ that we walk in Him. Well, what's the response then? Quickly, the last couple of verses. When they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and some will mock you too, okay? But they're not mocking you, they're mocking God, and that's on them, so pray for them. Don't take it personal. Don't get all worked up. <laughs> it's, not, it's not about you. It's about Him and their soul and their eternity. Right? That's how we need to train our minds to think with the help of God. While others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Well, Paul leaves Athens and we don't know if they heard him again. Maybe some of them went on down to Athens and heard more detail. I like to think that they did. But we don't know that. Scripture silent. We will hear you again on this. You know what that is? That's a sin of presumption. <laughs> That's putting off the decision and saying, I'll get another chance. I'll wait. How do you know you're going to get another chance? How do you know after you leave those doors and go outside <coughs> that you may be dead before midnight tonight? How do you know? Isn't that presuming upon the grace of God? Since He gives life and breath and everything we have to us, every blade of grass, every piece of straw we eat in our cereal. It's all from him. So Paul de departed from among them. However, some men joined him, thankfully, and believed. Among them was Dionysus the Areopagite. So here is one of the chief men in the council, apparently. And a woman named Damaris and others with them. Not a big response. In the most intellectual, the most cultured city of the first century A.D. And I think I can say that historically accurate with respect to any of the other cities. What Athens was at that time, no place for God. Sound like our city. <laughs> so you think how few there are that respond to the love of God. Make sure you're part of that group. Amen? Make sure you're part of that group. Because there is a judgment coming, and it will be according to righteousness by the man who he has ordained, Jesus Christ. And he's not willing that any should perish, but all should be. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this message that you've given through the apostle. This was a man who saw the risen Christ. Paul saw him. He's talking from experience. We can rely on the message. But it's also part of the Word of God. And Lord, help us to be reverent in the Word of God and believe 
and respond with living faith and go on and act on it. Be with us as we part. Take us all home safely as we give you thanks now for this gathering. In the Lord Jesus' name we pray.